Ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to fall too far behind a tight schedule, so please get your last cup of coffee before the break and uh, let us gather. I probably should sing if not pray. <laughs> but, uh, and the allusion to the song is because Sterling Stuckey, uh, among others, has characterized the civil rights movement as a singing movement. And my colleague Leonard Brown agrees with that. Um, and, but we need to proceed. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizing committee, which consists of Kimberly Brown, uh, Matt Hunt, Gia Barboza, uh, Christopher Chambers. Thank you. And I don't think I left anyone off. And then, of course, the staff of the Humanities Center, and particularly um, Erica Koss and Megan Brisson, and people who provided financial help, uh, and people who have provided uh, uh, co-hosting for us through the Humanities Center. And last, before I present uh, Dean Utaporga to give you a kind of official uh, welcome. Uh, I want to thank the chairs of the departments that contributed materially uh, to uh, sponsoring this uh, two-day symposium. Um, Steve Vallis of Sociology and Anthropology, um, Mitchell Ornstein of Political Science, Harlow Robinson of History, and Bill Dickens of economics. So without further ado, welcome. And I turn the podium over to Dean Professor Uta Porger uh, to give you the welcome. Thank you, Bob. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our two-day symposium, How Far to the Promised Land, as uh, Bob already mentioned, the title of the song, with the subtitle, Civil Rights Since Brown versus Board of Education. I want to thank, first of all, so I too will start with some thanks here. First of all, I want to thank uh, Bob Hall for organizing this symposium together with the committee that he already named. As you know, Bob is interim chair of the Department of African American Studies, and he also holds a po an appointment in the Department of History. And like Bob, I also want to thank um, Erica Koss and the staff of the Humanities Center um, for supporting Bob in organizational matters. As you can see from the program, the Department of African American Studies, and Bob mentioned this again, um, is presenting this symposium together with our Northeastern Humanities Center under the leadership of Lori Lefkowitz, who's here today as well. So thank you for the support of the Humanities Center, which is in our college, as you all know. Um, and thank you for the support of the many departments that co-sponsored the symposium. As you also know from the program that you have all received, I think, um, it is part of our campus series, 50 Years Forward, a series that asks us all to reflect on the promise and achievements of the civil rights movement and also of civil rights legislation, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964. 50 Years Forward also commemorates the 40th anniversary of our Department of African American Studies, and so in that context in particular, it's a pleasure to see the department behind this two-day symposium. It also commemorates the 40th 45th anniversary of the African American Institute, and as you know, we are of course here in the wonderful space of the John D. O'Brien African American Institute, and let me just thank, thank Richard and Marion and the staff of the Institute also for um, hosting us once again and for collaborating with us regularly. It's always a pleasure to work with you. <laughs> 
50 years forward and how far to the promised land are titles that provide a thought-provoking just juxtaposition. 50 years forward puts emphasis on the great strides that we have made in this country and the world since the civil rights era. And at the same time, it is meant to honor those who helped propel the struggle for civil rights. How far to the promised land puts us into a contemplative mode. It asks us to go, the title asks us to go back more than 50 years um, to the 1950s, if you look at the subtitle of our symposium, and also to reflect explicitly about the struggles and obstacles that the fight for equality and justice has encountered and continues to encounter. I'm delighted that our keynote speaker today, Peniel Joseph, and tomorrow's panelists have agreed to engage with us in such a conversation. And it is wonderful to see a program where speakers will address questions of success and obstacles from a variety of angles. These angles include public policy, they include questions about how struggles for gender and racial equality have intersected, they also include something that we are becoming ever more aware of as scholars, but something that, of course, participants in the civil rights struggle always knew, and that is that struggles in the United States were always interlinked with struggles abroad, and especially so with the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And I think the various commemorations and remembrances in the uh, context of Nelson Mandela's death have certainly been powerful reminders over the last um, couple of months of these important connections. Let me then thank our keynote speaker and the panelists for being here and turn the microphone over one more time to um, our symposium organizer and my fellow historian, Bob Hall. Thank you, Dean Porter. Because we want to get down to the meat of the evening, I shall be brief. You may read Professor Joseph's profile in the program. I'm just going to promote a couple of his books <laughs> and indicate that the bookstore has kindly uh, provided for sale and signing uh, two of his books, uh, Dark Days, Bright Days, From Black Power to Barack Obama, and Wait Till the Midnight Hour, A Narrative History of Black Power in America and to announce the forthcoming biography of Stokely Carmichael, due out in March. There are flyers for that in the back. I think, in light of the contents of the program, Professor Peniel Joseph is a person who needs no further introduction and we'd like to get down to the talk and his keynote address. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I'll add one thing to the introduction that I'm I, currently at Tufts University. Um, Department of History, where I direct uh, the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. And um, I'm really, really happy to be here uh, this afternoon. And this whole idea of celebrating or commemorating 50 years forward is really an important time to think about civil rights, human rights, and really American democracy in a, in a historical, expansive context. Uh, because really the civil rights movement, the black power movement, um, I've written and studied extensively these movements. And these were movements for small d democracy, even when um, people were saying, hey, they're feminists, they're Marxist-Leninist, uh, they're pan-Africanist, um, they're revolutionaries. They, at bottom, were trying to create a new world, a new society. Uh, SNCC in 1962 has... Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee has one of the most iconic um, photos of the time period with John Lewis uh, kneeling almost in prayer with two other activists flanking him. And it says, come, um, let us build a new world together. And, and when I teach, I'm teaching the civil rights course at Tufts now, when I, when I talk about that and I show that, um, I show images of SNCC, but I also show images of the Black Panthers. I show images of the Combahee River Collective. 
I show Angela Davis, but I show Audre Lorde, right? Um, I, I show different activists, um, black, white, um, Latino, Cesar Chavez, and there's a new movie coming out about Chavez. And really, students are still trying to grapple with what it all means because the history has been poorly explained, right? Um, and I'm, I'm excited about the new biography of Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, because Stokely is, is a, a figure, and I was talking about this earlier, who um, America has been unable to redeem. And what I mean by that is that what we've done over the last two decades is really tried to redeem the civil rights movement. And when I say redeem, I'm putting that in quotes. We've tried to sanitize the civil rights movement. Um, it, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, it begins with Rosa Parks, although historically that's not true. Um, it ends with King's, uh, or it, it has a down, downturn with King's assassination. And then finally, um, sort of Barack Obama's election is the promised land, right? We, we, you know, everything you fought for uh, came true in November of 2008. So one of the things I tell my students is that in future decades, we're going to say that we achieved a post-racial society between Obama's election in November of 2008 and his inauguration on January 20th, 2009. So there's going, to be a, there's going to be a little interregnum there where everybody's getting along. People are, blacks and whites are singing patriotic songs. People are in tears. New York Times says racism's over. I hadn't even gotten the news. That was, thank you, New York Times. Racism's done. Um, Newsweek concurs, Time Magazine, all these different things. Um, we found out that that's not true. And even, even before Barack Obama's election, what we've seen when it comes to the struggle for civil rights, and I'll get into details in a moment, is that it's always preceded in fits and starts, right? So for every passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act, or Voting Rights Act, or Fair Housing Act, or the Brown decision, there is going to be um, setbacks. And it's not just setbacks in terms of battles over affirmative action, battles over diversifying um, universities and corporate America. It's really massive setbacks and civil rights violations like the issue of mass incarceration that we're dealing with now. Mass incarceration is the 21st century civil rights issue of our time. Mass incarceration is connected to global wars that are in perpetuity right now in 2014 that King talked about as early as 1962. Even before he talks about fierce urgency of now and where do we go from here, chaos or community in 1967, Dr. King was saying that militarism, materialism, and racism were the three gigantic triple threats to humanity. He's saying this in 62 when he's speaking, right? So sometimes people will say King shifts in the last three years of his life, but you read Thomas F. Jackson's From Civil Rights to Human Rights, which is the best book on Dr. King's political thought, and you see that between 55 and 68, there was always a revolutionary there. But what he did in certain portions of his public political career is massage the message. Post-65, there's no massaging the message, right? So post-65, we get a Dr. King who's literally and figuratively on fire, like one of his best biographers, Taylor Branch has said. Uh, he becomes a pillar of fire post-63. And, and the fire that he's bringing, and again, Dr. King's not the only person to bring fire. You've got Amiri Baraka, the late um, uh, Imamu Amiri Baraka, formerly Leroy Jones. I was at his uh, homecoming um, in January at Newark Symphony Hall. 4,000 people were there. Um, um, there were so many grassroots people and dignitaries there. Uh, Baraka is one of the protean figures of the 20th century. Um, Arnold Rampasad has said his impact on culture and letters rivals that of Frederick Douglass. So when we think about Baraka, don't read the New York Times to find out who Imamu Amiri Baraka was. They hated Baraka. And the reason they hated Baraka is because even though in 1960 he was called the king of the Lower East Side, he rejected the mainstream stardom. He rejected the chance for the Pulitzer Prize. He rejected, you know, he got the Obie Award for Dutchman in 1964. He rejected all of that to speak truth to power and redefine and reimagine what it meant to be black, both in the United States and globally, right? So he disappointed 
so many white patrons that they would still call him Leroy Jones decades after he adopted the term and the name Amir Baraka. Same thing with Muhammad Ali. There's still white folks who are going to call him Cassius Clay because Cassius Clay is the person that they want to remember, right? They don't want to remember a revolutionary who's named Muhammad Ali. Um, when we think about this idea of civil rights, briefly, when we conceive of civil rights in the United States, what we've done is basically conceived of a short civil rights movement, right? Jacqueline Dowd Hall talks about a long civil rights movement. I want to talk about a black freedom struggle. And that short civil rights movement is really between 1954 and 1965. And I'll be even more specific. It's between May 17, 1954 and August 6, 1965. And that's a period that I like to call the heroic period of the civil rights movement, right? And one version of that story really unfolds with cinematic intensity. You've got the Brown decision, May 17, 1954. You've got the Brown II decision, which really is a strange decision because it's supposed to clarify the first decision, but it, what, it, what it does is obscure and muddle that decision by saying that schools have to desegregate with all deliberate speed, right? Um, white citizens who are anti-black in this country, which means the majority of the country, um, what they do is create something called white citizens councils. And white citizens councils are not the Klan. These are citizens who go to PTA meetings, who are church-going, God-fearing white supremacists. That's the United States of America. That's not a soft and fuzzy, warm story for our children to embrace, but it's the truth. And no one wants to speak the truth anymore. Absolutely not. When we think about what white citizens councils did, they, they erected something called massive resistance against the very idea of small d democracy and citizenship for people who happen to be darker. That's America. That's the story. It's not a bedtime story, which is why we hate to tell the truth in this country. Instead, we remember to forget, right? 1955 is Emmett Till, the 14-year-old black boy who's going to be assassinated and lynched in Money, Mississippi um, for allegedly uh, speaking out of turn to a white woman um, while visiting his uncle. And Emmett Till is 14 years old. He's going to be emasculated. He's going to be shot in the head, um, going to be brutally lynched. His body's going to be found in the Tallahatchie River with a 125-pound cotton gin fan belt tied around his neck. But the reason why Emmett Till, and we made the big comparisons between Emmett Till and Trayvon Martin uh, this past year, but the reason why Emmett Till doesn't become just another black boy who's dead, right, is because his mother allows his casket to be viewed. She says she wants the world to see what they've done to her boy. But it's not the world, it's the United States of America. So the same country that Barack Obama talks about, American exceptionalism, the best country in the world, destroyed and murdered Emmett Till. And if you want to understand the United States of America, you can't just embrace the good, you've got to acknowledge the bad. And you've got to acknowledge that when we think about the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement is a movement not just for human rights, not just for small d democracy, but it's a movement against racial terrorism right here in the United States of America. That's what everybody lived with in the United States of America, racial terrorism. It was systematic, it was brutal, it was institutionalized, right? It was connected to the criminal justice system, it was connected to pseudoscience, and it was connected to religion. It was money, it was religion, it was militarism, it was institutions, including institutions right here in Boston. So it's Northeastern University, it's Tufts University, it's the Boston public school system, it's New York where I'm from. We are all implicated in the politics and practices of white supremacy that the civil rights movement was trying to destroy. And it did not succeed. It did not succeed. The reason we have mass incarceration today is because it did not succeed. The reason we have so many black people who are unemployed today, twice as many as whites, and when we think about poor black areas in Boston, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Oakland, 45, 50, 60 percent, there is a crisis in America. There is a crisis in America that a black president refuses to confront, that his administration refuses to confront. 
That State of the Union is not nearly enough for the crisis of race in America right now in 2014. So the best thing we can get out of these commemorations, and I'm going to continue with that trajectory, is fuel and ammunition to how do we grapple and fight with the racial terror that we face in the United States today. And that racial terror is connected to economic terror. It's connected to gender discrimination. It's connected to homophobia. It's connected to the way in which poor people are so disrespected in this country that they don't even exist in the minds and hearts of politicians. 50 years ago, we talked about a war on poverty. We turned that war on poverty into a drug war that was a war against the black poor. We went from 500,000 people in US prisons to over 2 million in 34 years because a drug war was adopted to destroy black and brown poor people in the United States. And it's only because Michelle Alexander's heroic book, The New Jim Crow, has become a bestseller that mainstream elite blacks who are wedded to a politics of respectability have even discussed the idea and the issue of mass incarceration. When we think about 1957, we think about Little Rock, Arkansas, and the Little Rock Central High School crisis, and, and the desegregation that was forced. Uh, 101st uh, Airborne Division is forced to uh, escort um, um, the Little Rock Nine. Uh, 55 to 56 is the 381-day bus boycott. When we think about that, we distort what really happened. Rosa Parks was an activist. Rosa Parks was a organizer. Rosa Parks had been mentored by people like Ella Baker, who was the founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Rosa Parks was a long marcher. There were other people like E.D. Nixon who were organizing, part of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. These were hard, 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 long marchers. These were people who knew that Montgomery, Alabama was going to be not just a test case, but it was going to be ground zero in a new struggle to try to transform and defeat white supremacy in the United States. Now, the bus boycott also introduces a 26-year-old Martin Luther King Jr., but all he is is the spokesperson. He's not the leader of that movement. The leader of that movement are grassroots activists who had been connected with Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. They were grassroots activists who were connected with pacifism. They were connected with trade unionism. They were connected with radical anti-colonialism of the 1930s and 40s. Southern Negro Youth Congress, Civil Rights Congress. They were connected with A. Philip Randolph, who had been in Harlem during Garveyism, who had been a socialist, who becomes a radical trade unionist. By 1960, when we think about February 1st, the sit-in movement becomes something that actually amplifies energies that had been around in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. The sit-in movement in Greensboro, North Carolina, is going to spark mass demonstrations all across the United States. What starts out with four black students from North Carolina a and on February 1st, 1960, there's going to be 50,000 students, including white students, who are sitting in and doing sympathy demonstrations in the spring of 1960. So we see that the, the growth of direct action starting in 1960. And that growth of direct action is going to transform not just civil rights activism in the United States, but also globally, because 1960 is also going to be the year of Sharpeville. It's going to be the year of, of many cataclysmic global crises. Now, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is really the most important grassroots civil rights organization of the period. And SNCC is going to be an organization that generates so many different kinds of radicalisms. SNCC is going to generate second and third, second, second, second wave black and white feminisms, um, black nationalisms, black power, um, movements and struggles for interracial democracy with Freedom Summer and the Summer Project, anti-imperialisms, anti-war activism, that's all going to be SNCC. Harry Belafonte calls them the shock troops of democracy. SNCC and Robert Moses go to Macomb, Mississippi. Robert, Bob Moses calls Macomb the middle of the iceberg in 1961, when he's in a jail cell with 13 other prisoners. The middle of the iceberg. He says Mississippi is America, where you get jailed and killed for trying to pursue voting rights. And this is America 53 years ago, 53 years ago. 
that doesn't leave your system in 53 years. I'm here to tell you that. So if in 1961 you could be killed and shot in Macomb, Mississippi for citizenship rights, Barack Obama doesn't erase that legacy. He doesn't erase the continuation of that legacy right here and now. He refuses to talk about it. He refuses to talk about it. So it's, and remember, Dr. King didn't expect Lyndon Johnson to talk about it either. Dr. King talked about it. And so did Stokely Carmichael. Fannie Lou Hamer gave, gave the, the testimony before the Credentials Committee in 1964 talking about how she had been viciously, brutally beaten and assaulted in Winona, Mississippi for, for, for trying to be a decent human being. That's what she said, right? And what does Lyndon Johnson do? He calls a press conference because America's dirty, nasty little secret cannot be televised live to the entire country, right? And that's the civil rights movement. Very briefly, 61, we talk about the Freedom Rides. And the Freedom Rides are inter interracial groups of riders between May and December who, who, who travel the country trying to defy racial segregation. Uh, very famously, May 4th, 1961, they're going to be firebombed in Anniston, Alabama. We know now that the FBI allowed um, um, local vigilantes to get 15 minutes alone with freedom riders. So one aspect of the civil rights movement that we don't want to talk about is the fact that the Department of Justice in the United States was the Department of Injustice when it came to the civil rights movement. It was the Department of Injustice when it came to the civil rights movement, when it came to protecting black lives. Now, of course, there's going to be some exceptions, but in the main, the FBI, it runs wild not just against Martin Luther King Jr., but against innocent, peaceful, nonviolent demonstrators. And that's the legacy of the FBI. And that is such a, such a grotesque legacy that in the late 80s, by 88, 89, they had to invent a movie called Mississippi Burning where the FBI agents were the heroes, right? So what, what you get in the United States about the civil rights movement is the, is the big lie, the big lie where you say, actually the opposite of what occurred, you say it enough and people start believing, well, wow, the FBI helped Dr. King, huh? They helped find Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman. When we think about 1962, 62 is the year where James Meredith helps desegregate the University of Mississippi in September, and there's gonna be three days of rioting in Oxford, Mississippi at the prospect of having the first black student. 62 is also where King tries to desegregate Albany, Georgia, and really is going to run into massive resistance, but the resistance this time is not going to be as brutal. King is looking for a confrontation that's going to show the world the, the brutality of segregation, show the world the misery of segregation, show the world the injustice of, of, of Jim Crow. And what he gets is a, is a sheriff who, who, who lets him go. He, he, he's, he's combating that strategy. He's going to have better luck in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. And we've got, we've got um, um, Diane McWhorter's Carry Me Home. We've got all these, these, these very, very important books about Birmingham, Alabama. 63 is going to be very important because it's the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation, right? It's also the year James Baldwin comes out with The Fire Next Time, which is really the, 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 the brilliant masterpiece of the civil rights period. And, and Jimmy Baldwin, um, gay, black, uh, proud, human rights activist, ally of Malcolm and Martin and Stokely, um, a beautiful, heroic uh, warrior of this period who, 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 who is not remembered often enough, who dies way, way too soon in 1987. Um, when we think about 63, 63 is not just the year of the March on Washington. 63 is also the Walk for Freedom. Right? June 23, 1963, in Detroit, where allies of Malcolm X, because Malcolm figures into this thing heavily, mm -hmm. allies of Malcolm X organize a sympathy demonstration. 125,000 people come to Detroit on June 23, 1963. Reverend Albert Clegg, C.L. Mm -hmm. Franklin, um, James and Grace Lee Boggs, mm -hmm. long marchers, strivers, are coming to Detroit in 1963. Malcolm X in 1963 has his very famous message to the grassroots, right? And, and that speech in November of 1963 
is a speech where Malcolm distills the whole idea of anti-colonialism, the whole idea of, of black power and black internationalism, the whole idea of anti-imperialism in that speech that others like Stokely Carmichael, like the Black Panthers, like Angela Davis, are going to take and carry on in the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, Malcolm is talking about the Vietnam War in The Ballad or the Bullet by the spring of 1964. So before SNCC comes out against the Vietnam War, Malcolm X is talking about the Vietnam War, right? Before people are saying they're anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist, Malcolm X is saying that in Message to the Grassroots. So a lot of what we're going to see in the late half, second half of the 60s, was already being witnessed uh, in the late 50s and the first half of the 1960s. When we think about the March on Washington, March on Washington, August 28, 1963. We just did huge commemorations for the March on Washington. Well, the March on Washington was not just a march for can we get along? How can we just be buddies with each other? The March on Washington was a march for jobs and freedom. King, he, he, he opens up his speech. One of the main mantras of his speech is saying now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. He definitely talks about the blank check and reparations and saying that we refuse to believe that the Bank of American Democracy is bankrupt and we've come to cash a check that says insufficient funds. But he says now is the time to make real the promise of democracy. So that's a combative speech. John Lewis's speech, parts of which were censored, it's a combative speech, right? A. Philip Randolph, it's a combative speech. Right? Even Roy Wilkins says that W.E.B. Du Bois has passed in Ghana that same day and says that Du Bois was calling us all to this meeting, you know, decades and decades ago. Because W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who is the premier intellectual of any color of the 20th century, right? So Du Bois is a peer of whoever you got. Whether you're saying you got Albert Einstein or William James. I got Du Bois and Frederick Douglass and some other people. So when we think about 63, 63 is important not because it's some kind of valediction to the American dream, but precisely because King is critiquing the American dream in that I have a dream speech. But what people do is just take the refrain, free at last, free at last, forget the meat and substance. Bob was talking about the meat and substance. Forget the meat and substance of that speech. Very quickly, September 15th, 1963, four little girls are going to be brutally murdered. Uh, 16th Street uh, Baptist Church in Birmingham. That's the church that Condoleezza Rice's family went to. That was the black elite church. Four girls are going to be killed. And, and finally, November 22nd, Kennedy is assassinated. Now, 64, when we think about that timeline, we're in the 50th anniversary of 64. In 64, January 8th is the State of the Union, um, war on poverty, civil rights. Uh, the reason why Johnson is talking about civil rights is because there's a movement that's forcing that conversation. There's no other reason why. It's not just, it's not just top down. It's not just, we have all these great books, Bob Caro, um, um, other multi-volume biographies of Johnson and presidents, but what we don't talk about is the fact that presidents come to the grand moment, the stage, when people force them to, okay? When events, presidents don't make history, okay? History makes presidents, right? That's how it works. And so when we think about State of the Union, war on poverty, 64 is very, very important. Even before we get to the passage of the Civil Rights Act on July 2nd, what we have in that, in that interregnum. And there's a, there's a great play uh, called All the Way that is about to come to Broadway and that the ART was showing um, earlier last year about Lyndon Johnson's first year as president before his election to, pre to the presidency in 64 and right after Kennedy is assassinated. So it's really less than 365 days. And th that play is extraordinary because some of the characters include Bob Moses, Stokely Carmichael, and it gets into the ins and outs of, of what happened, and it shows these multiple and multiple dimensions of, of, of what happened during that time period. So it's really a, 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 a very, very important play. When we think about 64, 64 is also the year 
that Malcolm X is an independent political activist. It's the year that Malcolm X goes to Africa two times. He had been in 1959, but he goes as an independent political activist. He's a revolutionary Pan-Africanist. He breaks with the Nation of Islam. He, he, he comes up with all kinds of interesting creative ideas and critiques. He talks about the ballot and the bullet, the ballot or the bullet. He visits Tuskegee uh, uh, in Alabama. He tries to hook up with MLK. Um, um, he doesn't see him that time, but they do see each other. In, in March of 64, uh, when the Senate is filibustering the Civil Rights Bill, and there's that brief photo and that moment there. But it's very, very important, because what Malcolm is trying to do is craft a black united front domestically and globally, right? And that's often missing from that conversation, right? Malcolm is, is in contact with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He is uh, bringing Fannie Lou Hamer to New York and calling her one of the nation's most foremost freedom fighters, right? So all these alliances and connections are happening that it's very, very important to see. Um, 64 is also the year of SNCC's summer project. Now, we, we usually don't talk about what happened in the summer project. We talk about the people who were martyred in the summer project. Very important to talk about Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman, but it's also very important to talk about 41 different freedom schools that are created that summer. The thousands of people who are touched that summer by what SNCC tries to do. It's an experiment in interracial democracy. There's going to be over 1,000 white volunteers, the young students who come down and try to, to, to participate in that experiment, right? And what's interesting about Freedom Summer is that it really transforms the way in which we look at black power if we know that somebody like Stokely Carmichael was the second congressional district director, right? And, and so many young white and black students were inspired and mentored by him, where he's telling these young students to come to the Delta so that they can organize in the Delta. So what, what's, what's amazing about, about this time period, and, and let me conclude by saying 65 is going to be the year of Selma. 65 is the year of Selma, uh, bloody, bloody Sunday on March 7th, 1965, turnaround Tuesday. Um, Lyndon Johnson does the, the, the speech on March 15th to a joint se session of Congress where he talks about um, the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. When we think about um, um, Selma, Selma is very, very important. March 21st to March 25th is going to be the concluding march. Now, that's not only a march that goes from um, Selma to Montgomery, that's a march where SNCC activists led by Stokely Carmichael, they burrow deep into Lowndes County, Alabama, and that march is going to sow the seeds for the original Black Panther Party, right, in, in Alabama. So on some levels, when you think about that, there's so much rich irony in there where SNCC is so identified with Malcolm X, and it's really Dr. King that helps open up Alabama for them in that march even though they have, they have disagreements. But Stokely always professes his undying love and commitment to Dr. King because he says Dr. King taught black people to face racial terror without fear. That's what he says. And he, he had known Dr. King since 1963, had served as his bodyguard and driver in Greenwood in 64, and of course becomes very close along the Meredith March in 66. And they headline the, the, the country's largest anti-war demonstration ever up until that point on April 15, 1967 mm -hmm. at, the, at the United Nations. That goes from sem the, sheep, the Sheep's Meadow in Central Park down to the United Nations with people like Benjamin Spock and mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte and Stokely is serving as the warm-up act for King. Um, and, and finally, the Voting Rights Act is passed in 1965. How am I doing for time? I don't want to go, go over right. <laughs> For, for time. Finally, the Voting Rights Act is passed in 1965, and that's our heroic period of the Civil Rights Movement, 54 to 65. The way in which this is told to our, our young people and our students is that um, that's all you need to know. Uh, one of the reasons why that is is because by 65, in the aftermath of Watts, because five days mm -hmm. after the Voting Rights Act, Watts explodes, right, August 11th to August 18th. Um, the, the, the Watts explosions, the racial rebellions, the unrest from 65 onwards, they don't fit in neatly into that narrative of a heroic period of the civil rights movement, which is why there's not been a Martin Luther King Jr. movie, 
even though I know there's two in the works. It's why you don't often, until the butler, get even a, a, a decent adaptation of really the fear and loathing that characterized America in that time. And the best thing about the Jackie Robinson movie is the way in which white supremacy is so casually displayed in that movie. That's America. That's our country. I'm not running for president, so I don't have to lie and say that this is such a terrific place to be and everybody has warmth and love in their heart. Because historically, empirically, it's not true. It's not true. You can go to the archives, you can interview the people who were actually alive during that time period, and you know that America, when we think about the post-war period, is a, is a brutally segregated, right, murderously violent, right, unapologetically racist nation, right? Doesn't mean that activists weren't trying to tra change it and transform it, but that's the status quo of the United States, and that's why people got assassinated. That's why people got killed. My students ask all the time, why were there all these assassinations during the time? You know, Kennedys, both Kennedy brothers, King, Malcolm, Medgar Evers, you know? And I should have mentioned Medgar Evers being assassinated right after John Kennedy gives the best speech of his life on race relations and civil rights, you know? June 11th, 1963, Kennedy's finest moment. He gives that speech and Medgar Evers is assassinated in the early morning, they're saying about 1 a.m., 1.30. Right? Um, in front of his wife and kids. Right? Um, that doesn't happen in a civilized nation. And, and Stokely Carmichael was constantly saying the whole, the whole notion of Western civilization was a misnomer. Right? He wasn't, he wasn't popular in, in mainstream audiences after saying that because when you tell the truth, mainstream audiences, the, the, the applause stops. Right? The applause stops, right? So when we think about the mainstream civil rights movement, that's it. What I want to focus on um, before concluding is that there's another narrative that we can tell our students, that we can teach to people, that really reconciles um, that, 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 that sepia-toned, everybody gets along, Martin Luther King Jr. saved us all, with the harsh reality that we hear and we experience today. Because our harsh reality is the reality of Trayvon Martin, it's the reality of mass incarceration. It's the reality of skyrocketing unemployment for African Americans and so many black babies being born who don't have a chance in the United States of America. That is our harsh reality. That's the harsh reality. The new normal is segregated public schools where the racial achievement gap is an enormous canyon and growing. The new normal is segregated suburbs and urban cities. The new normal is segregated universities and HBCUs that are in decline and on the verge of closing down, right? Including we've seen the dismal reports about Howard University, right? The new normal is a class of African Americans who are really part of a talented, not so much 10th, but an elite 1% who have access, who are entitled, who've got degrees from Ivy League schools, who refuse to speak truth to power and talk about the new Jim Crow. And it's not a new Jim Crow that's just mass incarceration. That metaphor extends to every single aspect of our daily lives in the United States, including the Shelby versus Holder voting rights decision, which is an absolute disgrace, which brings us back to the new Jim, to the old Jim Crow, right? Um, when we think about the new voting ID laws that everybody from Texas, it was just struck down in Pennsylvania, have tried to enact. This is the same politics of coercion and white supremacy that we saw enacted after the Civil War. And it's just updated. That's all it is, right? You don't have to say you don't want black people to vote. We understand what the message and the outcome is. So the new normal is that we see tremendous evidence of racism when it comes to racial disparities. Every single social economic indicator that's positive in this country, African Americans are disproportionately underrepresented. And every single one that's negative, they're disproportionately overrepresented. So the new normal is that we see racism in its outcomes. It's ugly, it's vicious, it's anything but subtle. But, but in the post civil rights context, post black power context, what people say is that, well, these folks just must not be trying hard. Cause, cause, cause I made it. You know, like my mother came from nothing and you know, I, I, I made it. I'm, I'm an immigrant from Nigeria. I'm an immigrant from Haiti. I'm from Jamaica, Trinidad. 
you know, I made it. My people were from the South. We made it, right? I don't even want to tell you what white immigrants and white ethnics think, right? Their whole thing is that, you know, just shut up, quit complaining. We had nothing to do with slavery, right? So the new normal is colorblind racism, right? The colorblind racism. And people will take conservatives, even in the 1970s, took it from Dr. King's speech, the whole notion, content of your character and not the color of your skin, right? But, but they don't want to talk about outcomes and disparities in outcomes. So what, what can we do? How can we talk about Martin Luther King Jr. at 85, the civil rights movement, um, in a way that's, that's profound, in a way that's substantive, and in a way that's hopeful? Well, the, the, the thing I want to really close with is this idea of, of, of talking about King at, at 85 and what King represents and how there's one aspect of King that can't be redeemed, and that's going to be King's ferocious critique of economic injustice, mm -hmm. war, right, and his critique of capitalism, mm -hmm. right? So King, they've redeemed King, and we set up a plastic King and a monument in Washington and a holiday, right? But, but they've only redeemed parts of King. They stopped King in 1963. They don't want to talk about Stanley Levison and adv advisors who were Marxist. They don't want to talk about King in, in Birmingham jail and what, what, what King meant when he said the great wells of democracy. He wasn't patting America on the, on the back when he said that one day the young people who are, who are organizing and are being brutalized in Birmingham, Alabama, we're going to be remembered for bringing this nation back to the great, those great wells of democracy that were dug deep by the founding fathers. King was being too kind. The founding fathers didn't envision multiracial, multicultural, multi-class democracy. Never. They didn't envision multi-gender democracy. They didn't envision any of this that we have right now. But what King was talking about was aspirational. The hopeful aspect of King was that, and in one of his last speeches, he says that the greatness of America lies in the right to protest for right, mm -hmm. right? King mm -hmm. was assassinated helping sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee, right? King's argument was that we could all be of service as long as we remembered the least of these. Mm -hmm. So if we, can, if we can remember that there are irredeemable parts to King and the civil rights movement, there are irredeemable parts to Stokely Carmichael and Black Power, the Black Panthers, Amiri Baraka, who really should have gotten a National Freedom Award, the Medal of Freedom, right? Long marcher, but you don't get a Medal of Freedom when you speak truth to power and you tell people who've, got, um, who've done grotesque things to citizens here and abroad that they're wrong. You don't get, you don't get medals, right? And even right now with Barack Obama, Barack Obama is not Martin Luther King Jr. That's what people were sold in 2008. You were electing Dr. King. No, you were electing a US president. When you look at a picture of Dr. King and Lyndon Johnson or Dr. King and John F. Kennedy, Obama is Kennedy and Johnson. Obama is not Frederick Douglass. He's Abraham Lincoln. He's the president of the United States. He can be a liberal president. Uh, b best progressive legislation since the Great Society, if you think about the Affordable Care Act, but he is not a freedom fighter. He is not an activist in the King mold, not at all. And we need to, we need to stop those comparisons. So I'll close, I'll close by saying 50 years onward, what we need to be doing is less patting ourselves on the back for the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Brown decision, um, and really trying to grapple with where we are today, right? Because we've, we've lost the profound uh, uh, sense of struggle that really animated these years. We've lost that. And our students and our young people don't even know what we're talking about, OK? Um, we've, we've lost any sense that the inequity that is running rampant Right? in the United States can not, not be uh, transformed, but can even be stemmed. Right? So, so what I'll close by saying, when we think about the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement is a time of social and political transformation, but it's a time of, of, 
of combative politics. It's a time of real robust debates um, and at times that broke out into physical violence over what was the meaning of American society and American democracy. Right? There were competing definitions of American democracy, and we still have that. We see Tea Party versus uh, labor unions. Um, we see, we see uh, conservative Republicans versus not just liberal Democrats, but social Democrats. Right? We see visions of democracy that are inclusive, that are expansive. We see others that are boiling us all down to building an ever bigger and broader police state and also a prison state, right? We see one vision of democracy that talks about diplomacy and another that says we're gonna be in perpetual war forever and, and taxpayers are gonna pay for it and we're never gonna eradicate poverty so long as we're building more bombs and we're setting up private contractors to make billions and billions of dollars in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Iraq, and all over the Middle East, mm -hmm. right? So I'll say, I'll close by saying, when we think about this civil rights movement, the greatest part of the civil rights movement that we can remember and commemorate 50 years later is that the civil rights movement was a movement for human rights and social justice that challenged all of us, that challenged all of us to transform institutions of social, political, racial, economic, gender oppression and speak truth to power. It wasn't about um, um, claiming victories when we, where we lost. It wasn't about um, patting ourselves on the back, and certainly it wasn't about commemorations and holidays and celebrations that are empty if the society that celebrates them is even worse than the past society that, that, that produced and forced the civil rights movement to be necessary in the first place. Thank you.
success? Because at the end, it sounded like you had a broader definition of success. Oh yeah, no, no, there are definitely successes in the civil rights movement. What I was saying is that the civil rights movement was trying to eradicate white supremacy in the United States. And when we think about that, that notion of white supremacy, what do we mean? We're talking about white supremacy as an ideology, as a set of belief systems uh, that, that has animated American democracy since the founding, but it predates that. A brilliant book that's out now is Ebony and Ivy by Craig Stephen Wilder that really looks at not just slavery and its connection with the Ivy Leagues, but it really looks at the way in which the ideology of white supremacy animated North America, but also North America's ties to a global system of slavery, and how that became connected with um, both the eradication of Native Americans, the enslavement of African Americans, but then the institutionalization of Jim Crow and a post-slavery vision of white supremacy that defined and denigrated African Americans as subspecies uh, it, both initially through religious thought and then through some what people call scientific racism, but really through science. So when we think about the civil rights movement, its broader goals was to try and eradicate all that. That was the only way you were going to be able to build the new world that SNCC talked about. I, instead, we've gotten what we have in 2014, where um, um, at least in terms of the statistics, there's 40 million African Americans, um, um, about, about uh, there's, there's close to 40% uh, um, um, living uh, underneath the, the federally established poverty line. Uh, it's a very high number. Um, there's maybe uh, another 28% uh, who are earning under $35,000 a year or more. Um, the statistics are saying there's only um, a few percent that make 200000 a year or more in the United States out of that $40 million. That's something like 4%, it's a very, very small percent. So when you look at those statistics, and you remember that during slavery, um, the labor of enslaved Africans is what provided the United States a context to be this global superpower, even in the 19th century. Um, Walter Johnson's new book, River of Dark Dreams, is really a wonderful um, examination of that in a way in which the, the uh, slavery in the Mississippi Valley was, was completely implicated in a global slave trade where uh, British um, um, credit uh, American slaves um, um, and cotton was, was, was all implicated in. So when we think about the successes, the successes when we think about civil rights, it has to go beyond certain acts and legislations or electing the president. What you're trying to do is eradicate that system um, the reason why there's hundreds of deaths of African Americans in Chicago and other places through inner city violence, and it's not a national crisis, is because of that system. It's because of that system. Now, what we've been told, African Americans, whites, conservatives, progressives, is that it's the fault of the individual. That's what we've been told. And we were told that during slavery. So Oscar Hamlin, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, none of these guys are geniuses who reinvented the wheel. Thomas Jefferson said Philip Wheatley was just a nigger. Yep. We've been told we were right. niggers from jump, yep. okay? Yep. So that's all, these are just new ways to articulate that yes, you are a nigger. That's all it is. So when they're telling you it's your boy's fault, he's in jail, when they're telling you it's the people's fault that all these people are being incarcerated and are being killed with gunshots. My brother's an emergency ER doctor in Baltimore. He, all, all, all the young black men, all the gunshot victims are young black men. And he's telling me, he's saying, look, um, this is not a coincidence. And if these were a bunch of young white men coming into my ER, there'd be a national crisis. And there'd be programs and something to eradicate this. So we should not be surprised. So the exception is, um, um, you know, Obama, or people are saying uh, King, or, or, or Malcolm making it out of jail. So Malcolm's in jail from 46 to 52, and he comes out of jail strong, proud, and does what he does over the next really less than 13 years. It's going to be 12 years and maybe five months. So that's the exception in this country, right? And if we could understand that, we'd stop believing they're neo-slave narratives, right? John Edgar Whiteman hipped us to what neo-slave narratives are and how they connect, they're connected to the old slave narrative. So the neo-slave narrative says, if this brother or sister Oprah Winfrey made it, how come you can't? Mm -hmm. So individuals can escape the plantation, because that's what this country is, a plantation. <laughs> and, and, and the collective community can't. But once you can't escape, they tell you it's your fault, right? 
They tell you it's your fault. And again, at times, even Barack and Michelle Obama have said that. You know, I, 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 I heard her speech when she was giving out her commencement speech, and he said it too, where, you know, stop watching TV, stop doing this and that. They're talking to Morehouse graduates. How can you disrespect those graduates and act like they're lazy and, and connected to stereotypes about blackness, right? And even in the New Yorker interview, he's talking about black pathology. That's an old hustle, Barack Obama. If we could get all these black people to the Puna House School, we wouldn't have any pathology. Right? So that's what we're talking about. Two, three, two, three. Way in the back. And then... Hi. Uh, I started being active in February 1st, 1960. Central organizing now is in state. Emmett Till was killed when I was 14. He would have been 72 today. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about Emmett Till. He was born the same year as Otis Redding was born. That's my year, 41. At six, so, I so was two. Yes. Stokely was in Washington when I was in Baltimore, and we did sit-ins 62. That's two years yeah. after uh, uh, North the North. first sit-in. Yeah. Route 40 demonstrations. Route 40 demonstrations. Yeah. And we would go this way. Yeah. And we would go every which way. I was charged with deciding to riot outside of the penitentiary. And I won. I was outside the penitentiary. <laughs> then I was the last out of the penitentiary when we broke down the theater outside Northern State College, Jim Crow. Wow. That was in 63, February 28th. I remember this as history. No, I remember this as my life. Mm -hmm. And you got everything right on the money. I would just ask two questions, very simple. One, people don't ask what the asset ratio is mm. between whites and blacks. Mm. Guess what it is? 10%? Mm. No. 50%? No. 20. 27. It's 100,000 to 5,000. 20 to 1. And most of it is the losses of under Obama, mm. where they lost jobs and they lost the ability to do work that they've done elsewhere, right. like in construction. I'm a construction worker 50 years this right. year. Right. So I'm just going to end by saying the 13th Amendment forbids slavery except, mm -hmm. except mm -hmm. when you've been found guilty of a crime and there's one million black men. Mm -hmm. One less statistic, 50% of black men have been arrested by the time they're 23. 40% mm. of white men have been arrested by the time they're 23. Why the disparity? Whites are given a pass, and blacks are given a plea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
you put her in prison, but what are we going to do? Yeah. And okay. what should Barack Obama yeah. do? Yeah. No, thank you. Right. In, in, terms of, in terms of support historically, I mean, it's, in, in some of us, it's easier to gauge Dr. King's support in the sense that um, um, one is going to be public opinion polls. So in, in the black community, he's uh, very much has huge favorability ratings um, you know, in, in the 1950s and 60s. And by the time March on Washington and then the Nobel uh, and even during black power, his, his, his favorables among black folks are very, very high. Mm -hmm. um, his favorable among whites starts to decline um, starting around 65, in terms of the end of 65, and into 66 um, in Chicago, yeah. So there's that. Malcolm's going to be different. I mean, Malcolm is, is the leader initially of more of a sect. I mean, people are going to say that the Nation of Islam has 25 to 50,000 people in it. Sometimes people say more or less at the time that he was in it, and he helped grow that group from really just several hundred to, to much larger numbers. Then he's going to have a more secular impact not just when he leaves, but through um, young young students, militants, and his speeches. I mean, by 61, he's the country's um, second most uh, sought after public speaker, and the first is Barry Goldwater. <laughs> uh, so so on, on the college lecture circuit. So he's gonna have a huge impact there, but certainly um, I would say that, that, you know, King, who's connected to the black church, um, even though he's got a star-crossed relationship with the largest black church organization, National Black Convention, uh, Baptist Convention, um, um, with Jackson has, has a real bit of relationship there. King, King has more, is going to have more breadth and depth of support um, um, nationally in that sense, where, where Malcolm is going to have um, real support, but it's going to be among people who are um, in urban cities, who are uh, have, been, have been connected at times to, to, to prison and other situations. On the Malcolm X, um, I think that his influence would be hard to measure, mm -hmm. even by opinion polls. Yeah, I agree. That, uh, when I was in college in 65 through 69, um, there were recordings, yeah. there were records yeah. that were being listened to by black students on college campuses and elsewhere. So that people could just about recite passages from the ballad or the bullet. Yeah. And then the socialists, George Brightman, George Brightman yeah. and Malcolm Bogus, X's last made speeches, sure yeah. that we got sure. all of their yeah. all of his speeches and things uh, in cheap, you know, paper uh, editions. Uh, and those were spread wide. Yeah, so, so the influence was, went far beyond. Those who might have sold yeah, to agree. the nation of Islam. I agree. And, and certainly public opinion polls, yeah, I can't measure that. I would say among movement people and intellectuals, um, you know, SNCC was giving out uh, recordings of Malcolm in Lowndes County to share problems, you know, so they could hear um, Ballad of the Bullet and hear some of the last speeches. So I, I, I agree. I agree. Well, in terms of what, what we can do now, I mean, one thing Obama could do, and he's doing stuff through a presidential order now, he's announced stuff, but a lot of it's disappointing to the extent, like, a year ago he could have announced this minimum wage, right? So a lot of stuff is mystifying in the sense of post-re-election, right? Um, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of what he could do about mass incarceration, the federal government, I give um, Eric Holder credit for the speech in August um, announcing uh, sort of transform criminal justice policy in terms of war on drugs. But the caveat is that the federal federal policy has 14% of inmates uh -huh. um, in there. So the caveat is that a lot of this needs to be redressed at the state level and the local level. Yeah. And some of it is um, purely because of economic constraints. But some, some it's, it's just moving towards the privatization yeah. of public prisons, right? So, so o Obama, He's a, he's a former constitutional law professor. So, I mean, he's, 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 he's really basically shipped this all off into Eric Holder's lap. But um, I think it's sad and disappointing that he's not been more forthright about this issue. Because the issue impacting the, the, the black community, if we think of it as a community, um, is going to be uh, mass incarceration. Now, for people who are doing well, and some people have never stepped inside of a prison. Um, I have to, 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 to talk and, and to teach and to, to speak. Um, 
th these things you know, are, are of no particular importance because these are just not your kind of people, right? Um, but for those of us who are interested and care about, about these parts of, of the community, then that's been disappointing. And as president, um, especially a second term president, uh, you know, what is there left to do with the Congress that's mm -hmm. intractable mm -hmm. than use your presidency as a bully pulpit? There's nothing left to do because there's literally no formal, formidable legislation that's going to be passed. Because if they pass immigration with no um, pathway to citizenship, we might as well have elect, elected a Republican. Yeah. You know, so if, if, if I'm hearing what I'm hearing leaking in the New York Times, that this cat is going to sign, and I say this cat, just like Stokely used to call Linda Johnson, this cat, the president. And that's why him and uh, Roy Wilkins had the big falling out. It's like, Stokely, don't call him this cat. You know, that's Lyndon Johnson. That's my president. That's why they had the big falling out. That's the truth. Um, if, this cat, if this cat signs an immigration bill that says no citizenship path for 11 million people, we might as well have elected Mitt Romney. Right? So unless, unless um, maybe Harry Reid will talk some sense with him, in him, maybe Nancy Pelosi, but if he's ready to sign an immigration bill, that, that uh, Republican leaders want, um, a lot of this will have been pointless if there's no path to citizenship. You know, it, That's not the bill to sign. It's like, hold the bill and wait for next elections where you can get it right at that point, whether that's Hillary in 2016 or, or somebody else. Can we field maybe three questions and then see if Professor Joseph can bundle those? And, and oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. yes. Hi, I'm Jackie Gobbin, and um, I wanted to ask you if you um, think that we're worse off today because of Obama's election. In that I think that, um, you know, white folks can pat themselves on the back, as you said, and say, you know, well, we're in a post racial society because we elected a black president. And, um, you know, that perhaps if there was, if, if uh, Romney or uh, John McCain had been elected, the Occupy movement might have turned into something more vigorous, or we, we might have more um, more of a grassroots kind of urgency to um, the, to address the, all the wrongs and horrible things that are going on that we talked about so well. Thank you. Another question. I'm trying to bump a question. Yes, I'm trying to do people again. The hungry, cold. All right, we'll do another we'll stop. Let's just do one more. Bill Crowder. Yeah, Bill Crowder. Yeah, uh, you kind of stop, I'm, it's not a critique, but you kind of stop with the 1965 Voting Rights Act repeal in 2013. Now, as I look at it, that's a retreat. It's going backwards mm -hmm. to where we were, who knows? Oh, yeah, uh, I agree with that. That's what I was saying. Yeah. That is what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Um, if you start uh, as it does, uh, giving Supreme Court legitimacy to the efforts to restrict participation. Where do you go from there? I yeah. mean, you can talk about Martin Luther King. One, I was in the South during the 60s, yeah. so, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's the ability, in my mind, to affect the political system. And the only way you really do it on a mass level is voting. Mm. So I see this as the most serious mm. uh, potential problem. Facing civil rights or minority rights. Okay, okay. yeah, no, I, I'll. Third question or. No, two is three. Okay, so I'm going to do it. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm from Brooklyn,
uh, if we're going to look at it from a different lens um, anytime in the future. And disruptions are always hard when you're an industry. Yeah. And so um, I think it's important to think about the framing really, really carefully. And uh, while I really appreciated everything you had to say, uh, and I don't know whether this is a question of tone or of, um, or of exclusion, but there's really, <laughs> the history has to be told in a way that is not male centered. No, I agree. And um, how do you do that? You, you don't just throw in the name of Fanny Lou Hamer uh, or Rosa Parks or say that there were others there. Uh, you don't just mention the unique nature of the leadership of Stokely Carmichael uh, and of Dr. King and of Malcolm. Uh, you, there, there's got to be some other way that's, well, that's wait yeah. a minute, may I finish? Okay. That is true to the history, uh, but that, that also expresses the expansive rationale behind the civil rights movement, which was uh, to, you know, enlarge our understanding of rights. And you can't talk about the civil rights movement in, in a box, you can't place the civil rights movement in a box that doesn't also acknowledge um, the women's movement that flowed from it, uh, the disability movement that flowed from it, and the movement for, um, for uh, gay and lesbian rights that flowed out of that. And once you do that, once you understand that as a civil rights movement, not just what was said on the platforms by Malcolm and by Stokely and by others, but once you, rec once you recognize the liberatory expression of the civil rights movement as it is reflected in all of these other um, arenas, then you diminish that male framing in some ways. And so that's kind of what it was slightly disturbing for me. Well, I, I, you know, thanks, thanks for coming. I, I don't disagree with any of that. I think that if, if anybody took my civil rights class, um, all of that is there over 16 weeks. I think, and even other talks that I give, they, points of emphasis um, just today um, might have not. I've given old talks where I'm just talking about family labor and other people. You're fabulous. I'm going to SBU apologize. Oh, yeah. Expressing yeah, no, I, you're no, wonderful. No, but I agree. And I, we need you. I, I, I actually, you know, I actually agree with the, uh, the second sad <laughs> tier of feminism as offshoots of the 60s and the summer. That was meant. I didn't go into enough detail, but, but um, I, I believe in terms of the disruption, even in waiting until the midnight hour, I, I um, um, don't try to just discuss women as, oh, they were there too, but as, you know, in, in the context as a constitutive element, um, and really even arguing that Lorraine Hansberry is the uh, forerunner for the black arts movement before Barack or you look at Raising the Sun and Bev Lung and all those, those things. So. Um, no, I agree. I think that the way in which I teach civil rights is that to my students, and I have a lot of white students as well as Tufts, mm -hmm. at Tufts, and it's predominantly white school if people didn't notice, um, <laughs> is to talk about those emancipatory, and we call them liberatory movements and moments, and to um, show and discuss how when we think about civil rights, uh, you know, gay and lesbian um, movements, women's movements, um, this is all connected, and it's all there um, at the core. So I, I actually completely agree with that. Um, very, very quickly there, in terms of voting rights, um, I, I think that voting is, is, is very, very important. And the comment I was making about 2013 and Shelby is that it's, it actually has set us back. So I think that voting is, is immensely um, important and powerful, and I agree that Shelby has, has set us back. I, I think that citizenship, the vote is a large part of citizenship, but it's not the only part. And I think that part of the problem with the 2008 election is that when we, when we look back in time, and social scientists and historians and different people are going to really write big books about like how did that all happen in terms of, and not just from an Obama-centered perspective, but from the perspective, how did, we, how did you get almost 70 million people interested enough to vote in 2008? So the most people in the history of the republic. And also, you know, anecdotal evidence suggests, if you really read newspaper accounts of the time, 
that um, Barack Obama as senator was seen by more Americans than any other presidential candidate in American history. And not just on television, but in person. Okay, like there were, there were larger rallies for him than any person would ever run for president in the history of the republic. Um, I think that convincing all those people to come out to see him, convincing almost 70 million people to vote, extraordinary, extraordinary. I think pedagogically, in terms of citizenship, when we think about Highlander Folk School, when we think about um, Septima Clark, Septima Clark is the person who was the, you know, uh, the, her mother was Haitian, born in 1898. Um, she's the teacher of the entire civil rights movement. She's teaching people what citizenship means. There would be no citizenship schools, freedom schools, without Septima Clark. Right? So Charlie Cobb, but it's Septima Clark. The whole idea was to teach people about citizenship in an expansive way, not just the vote, but what it meant. What did civics mean, especially if you were poor, if you were black, if you were a woman? Um, the Obama civics lesson only worked only up to a point. So it did galvanize people, it did get people to, to, to the uh, polls, and it did produce new, a new generation of activists. But many people, once they cast the vote, they stopped. Okay? And so there was no context um, um, to push uh, the person that they had elected president. You know, there was no, so that, that's where, to me, the vote is very important, but it's got to go beyond the vote. Um, and, then, and then finally, the whole idea of, of um, would we be off, better off, I, I would say no. I think that that was a, uh, uh, a debate that happened in 1968, that if, if Richard Nixon was elected, would, would, it, would the country be better off to the extent that he would be so right-wing that somehow people would wake up? That, that was what some people on the left said in 68. And, and that, that's not, you know, I think that election by election, you definitely want the more progressive candidate. What I will say is that Obama's election within the black public sphere has um, stymied discourse. It's stymied mm -hmm. dissent. Um, because we've, we've never had a black president in the history of the Republic. The Republic. What, what Obama has done as president, even the Clintons, as much as black people love the Clintons, and I've been in Harlem where Bill is there, and he's a rock star. <laughs> love him. Love him. Can't get enough. <laughs> um, as much as black people love the Clintons, the Clintons still needed surrogates um, to connect with black people, votes, different things like that. The Obama presidency bypasses all of that. You know, he bypass Certainly, Al Sharpton has become a kind of um, surrogate, and there's, there's others. But in a way, Obama just has to speak to the black community, and he's, he's fine. That's hurt the community, if you believe in robust discourse, debate, and also criticism of the president, mm -hmm. you know, of also criticism. And the criticism we're talking about is um, um, radical criticism or progressive criticism. Probably the only person whose criticism has made it beyond the den, um, who's been very critical, is Cornell West, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the public intellectual. Cornell's a, a friend. I, I think Cornell has done um, really yeoman's work there. I mean, sometimes, I mean, the language he uses is not necessarily the same language I would um, use at times, but he, he's been critical of, of president in a way that there's not been a mature enough black public sphere to let that criticism stand, right? So we can't, you know, too often black people, I've, I've criticized the president at, at, you know, the Apollo, I've criticized him in Harlem with the Schomburg, and too often uh, people don't want to hear, black people don't want to hear anything negative about the president. So it sets up a context where Tea Party criticism is the same as Cornell West criticism, right? Just because he's, he's, he's their icon, he can't be, which has been, which has impoverished um, our, our discourse. It's really impoverished. So that's been very, very disappointing. And, uh, you know, we have three more years to go of, of that. You know. We could stay here all night, yeah. I'm sure. Right. Consider this to be a conversation start. <laughs> the conversation continues tomorrow with three panels, one on civil rights law and public policy since Brown v. Board, featuring Matt Hunt, our own, Patricia Sullivan from the University of South Carolina, and Donald Tomaskovic Devi. And I think you'll find there, uh, particularly in Donald's stuff, some very uh, quantitative, data-driven uh, mm -hmm. items. Uh, and then in panel number two, 10.45 in the morning, how much farther for women?
Race, Gender, and Civil Rights, featuring Pamela E. Brooks and Carissa Freak. And then the closing panel, partly inspired by the recent uh, demise of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, is a panel on Jim Crow in the U.S. and apartheid in South Africa, a comparative look at race and democracy. And uh, Pam Brooks and one of her professors, Robert Hall, is going to hold the fort there. And Pam taking the lion's shit, I assure you. So uh, thanks very much for coming out. Yeah, and please so make yes. as many of the <clears throat> sessions tomorrow as you can and send your students. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much.